How are you feeling? Because this is the first ever Beyond Belmore podcast. Are you nervous? No, I'm not. I'm You've had a few debuts in your time. You've had a few debuts. This would be up there with probably one of your most nervous, I'm guessing. I'm just privileged to be here with you, mate. I love it. <laughs> I'm very excited. Look, I'm a bit nervous. I won't lie. This is the first time I'm doing a podcast, but we'll be fine. Let's do it. Mate, let's talk about the weekend. Big week for the club. Uh, multicultural round. We're obviously a, a massive multicultural club, multicultural area. How does it feel to, you know, walk down from the league club into, you know, our beautiful home ground at Belmore here? Yeah, it's always special playing at home. Um, we obviously got the feel of it, taste of it last year. Uh, we always meet down at the club and then walk down as a group. Um, all the boys have got their flags on representing their cultures. And yeah, it's always special just playing here in front of a packed out crowd and, um, yeah, it was unreal running out there on the weekend to get the win as well. Makes it even special. So, Yeah, you speak about the win, mate. Obviously, there was a little bit of pressure on us, 0-2 going into this game. Um, but I know, you know, playing with you boys last year and knowing what the series was about, I'm assuming it would have been just stick to the process, stick what we, stick to what we've been doing for the last two games and we'll win this game at home. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we just had to stick to the process. We were a bit unlucky there in the first um, two rounds. We... You know, we didn't have any possession and um, things weren't going our way, but we knew we were just that confident that weekend, uh, last weekend, going in the game. And, um, yeah, if we just stuck to the process and we knew that we'd come over the top. So, You had a great game yourself. I thought the spine probably worked the best. We, we've looked all year together. But there was one guy who, honestly, was just unbelievable. He plays on your edge, really army. I don't think I've ever seen a back rower have so many efforts on efforts. Kick chase, kick presser. Poor Tanner Boyd, <laughs> yeah. but he just, he just, it looked like he, he took it on himself to, to make a mark on that game. Yeah, for sure. He was, he was even speaking about it during the week, just what he's going to bring. And, um, I thought he did that, uh, backed it up and you just get so much energy watching him go there and doing all them little effort areas. And it, it just gives you so much spark watching him, you know, the charge down that he did, um, the pressure that he was putting on Tanner Boyd. Um, I would have hated to be on the other side when he's doing that, but, um, yeah, his little effort areas are so influential for the group and yeah he's a classy player so i'm just lucky to have him on the outside well don't worry if it makes tenor boyd feel any better that was me every day at training last <laughs> year that's why i retired early because i had to deal with kicks every single day but uh mate this podcast it's about you so let's delve into it mate it. A young young boy from dubbo talk to us mate take us back when you're a young kid did you did you start playing footy was your family involved tell us about matt burton as a kid yeah i sort of um yeah, I grew up in a little little house, little family of five. I was the youngest, mum and dad, and two older sisters. Um, yeah, I grew up out in Dubbo, small country town. There there wasn't much out there, but, um, yeah, I was really lucky that I um, had a really close family and, um, yeah, really lucky that, um, yeah, we got pretty much everything. And, um, yeah, I sort of grew up playing soccer when I was um, going through school and that, um, never really played footy, and then, um, I ended up going down um, down the road to uh, one of my mates' place and his dad was like a mad footy fan and uh, the boys were playing footy and he's just like, oh, what are your thoughts on playing footy? Um, and I was like, oh, I might as well give it a crack. And then um, he ended up signing me up. Mum and dad didn't even know about it. Um, signed me up when I was like nine, playing soccer at the time and then, um, yeah, ended up playing footy for the first time and I just loved it so much. Um, yeah, loved everything about it. Ended up quitting soccer and just going straight to footy was footy mad from then and uh, I yeah, played it ever since. It's funny you say that because I'm pretty sure the great Hazem El Masri also started off playing soccer. Do you do you feel it give you some some really good coordination because obviously you're known for, you know, your kicking game. Do you feel soccer helped with that at an early age? Yeah, I think so. I've spoken to heaps of people as well that have played soccer as a kid and like kickers in footy and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it does give you the bit of an extra edge playing soccer as a kid just that's what you really do so yeah yeah nice so you played for if if i'm right, st john's and dubbo sims yeah so st john's is a junior club in dubbo okay and then from 18s on that's dubbo sims so yeah grew up um that was my junior club growing up st john's uh as a junior and then from under 18s went into dubbo sims which is a feeder club for them so so playing for for sims so I'll be, I'll be doing a few country trips trips of late, and I find the one thing I have found is, so kids in the city, there's all, 
we're always being watched. There's always exposure. We're always, you know, being watched by this scout, that scout managers around. Do you feel that in the country, sometimes you're a little bit forgotten about? And I suppose when you do have those chances to impress people, they're very minimal because you have to have a good game on that exact day. Whereas a city kid, you've probably got three or four chances to do that throughout the year. Did you feel that growing up in the country? Yeah, I did a little bit. There's obviously, yeah, there's um, obviously not that much opportunity out there, but yeah, I just thought any time that I had an opportunity to um, just take it with both hands and make sure that I gave it everything because, yeah, I just wanted it that bad. And, um, yeah, them opportunities are pretty rare out there. I think it's growing the game out there, but, um, yeah, there's not much opportunities. But, yeah, I think growing up, then, yeah, I definitely wanted to make the most of it. Yeah, we're definitely spoiled here in the city. Like, we can go to a call stadium, Combank, Shark Park within 45 minutes, but that's what I feel when, you know, when we do take games to the country, when we do get kids that come from there, you really appreciate it. That's that's just from me being a, a city slicker I am, but I, I just feel that sort of, that's the feel from the country. Is that what you feel when, when they do, the NRL do take games yeah, out it's there? Yeah, That's all you want as a kid, like, to, to watch NRL games out there. Like, you never think it's going to happen. And then uh, I remember they brought the country versus city out there. I was probably like, nine or ten and that was the best thing ever like as a kid watching nrl games out there that's all that's all you want to do and that's all you dream about so to get like little games out there just inspires young kids out there to want to play footy so i think it's mad what position did you play when you were young mate five eight five eight were you always were you picked in sides were you were you na- did you have natural ability or you feel you had to work on your game as a kid uh i had a little bit of ability but Definitely had to work hard. Um, sort of missed out on a few sides when I was younger. It sort of drives you as well. You see boys that are making it and um, boys that have got contracts and stuff like that and it just makes you work harder for for what you want. And um, Yeah, if you work hard enough, then it will happen. So. I know there's some massive rivalries in some country towns. An example, I went down to Parks for something uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was trying to do an affiliation with Parks and Forbes and they're only 30 minutes apart, and they were off it. Yeah. They weren't doing it. Was there any any, any rival towns that you always a yeah, couple, of, couple um, of stinks with? Yeah, definitely Macquarie Raiders. That's um, That was definitely our rivalry growing up. It was just a massive like rivalry. Every time we played them, there was always stinks and um, push and shove. But, um, yeah, it was mad. It, that's what they're the games you look forward to. And, um, yeah, it was mad to just get the whole Dubbo community watching the game, just that rivalry, just... Makes it all even better. So, for all the Dubbo Sims fans out there, when Matt Burton retires, will he ever be putting a Sims jersey back on? You never know. Yeah, I'd, oh. love, to, I'd love to put it back on. Yeah. You heard it. Here, you heard it here first. I'm still going. His podcast. <laughs> it could be a Sim. Hopefully, what ten years to go in the NRL? Yeah. Easy. Nice. So, mate, you start off. You know, Penrith. Penrith pick you up. Yeah. Um, can you explain to us how that did happen? How, how you did get scouted down to Penrith? Yeah, I was. Um, I was playing rep footy out in Dubbo, um, school footy and stuff like that. And I remember we had a trial down at St. Mary's and um, one of the Penrith scouts was down there and he just, he approached me and just come up. I didn't have a manager or anything at the time. And uh, he come up to me and just said, how would you like to come down for trial? And I was like, yeah, it was sorted out. What not? Anyway, a couple of weeks later, come down for the trial. I was still pretty young. Um, I think I was only 16 or 17 playing in a 19s trial. So I didn't really have the best game. I was just in there to see how, see how I went sort of thing. But, um, yeah, they were pretty happy with how I went and um, ended up keeping an eye on me um, th- as I grew up. And um, when I was in 17s, Western Rams, they sort of um, picked me up and um, signed a few of us country boys. Um, so, yeah, ended up signing for a couple of years. And then, um, yeah, when I signed, I ended up, I uh, didn't want to move down to Sydney straight away. I was still pretty young and um, would have got pretty homesick. I was mm. loving it back out home and uh, just wanted to finish school and stuff first. So I was pretty l- lucky enough that they let me do that. And then, um, yeah, when I when I finished school, I ended up moving down. Um, yeah, actually, I've just skipped a bit. Mm. I was um, at, at school, I was traveling down for SG Ball, so... The school, um, I'd have every Friday off school, travel down, pick pick two of the other boys up that signed, and then uh, we'd go down, play SG Ball on Saturday, and then drive back home on Sunday. So 
How good is that? Yeah. Every Friday off school. Yeah. I used to have every Friday off school too, but I jigged. <laughs> <laughs> You're just wagging. Yeah, I was just wagging. But no. So how was that, mate? Like you're driving every day. What, what is it? Four hours? Yeah, it's four and a half. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Like I was only just on me on me P's just gotten it. So like I was flogging the hell out of mum's car. She wasn't that <laughs> happy about it. I was ticking the K's up on it. But um, yeah, it's pretty crazy driving down that young. But just fortunate enough to get the opportunity to to do that as a kid like yeah it's that's all you all i wanted to do so to do that i was pretty grateful and lucky enough to do it, so i got a big question what were you listening to for four hours every <laughs> week in that car trip podcast oh, silence a bit of everything <laughs> yeah i ran out of songs i think country yeah a bit of country a bit of country yeah. very it's funny you say that but i was only talking about it the other day like being from the country everyone thinks you listen to country and all that but i think it's the opposite like being from the country, there's a lot of people that listen to different stuff. Like everyone thinks, oh, because you're from the country, you just listen to country. Oh, I don't mind a bit of everything. There you go. Just mix it up. I like that. Mm. That's, it's, that is that is interesting because I, I, I'm not going to lie, I made that assumption. Yeah. I made that assumption about country rule, but yeah. I, I'm i a city slicker, but I don't like country music, <laughs> unfortunately. But, yeah. mate, so 2019, yeah. fair to say the biggest, biggest year of your life. Mm. So... Talk us through it. You went from playing Jersey Flag, got a start in Reggie's, and then played NRL. I, yeah. I do not think that would be there would be many people that have done that. How did you go from playing at Cranbrook <laughs> Cranbrook Oval yeah. to Penrith Park? Like, how did you deal with it all? How did you deal with the you know the rise of fame? How did you deal with people talking about Matt Burden every day, the papers and stuff? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Like, it happened that fast that, um, yeah, I didn't really, at the time, you don't get, like, much time to reflect and think about it. But, yeah, I just wanted to um, enjoy my footy and that's all I wanted to do was play footy. And that was uh, what I was down there for. It just happened so fast. Like, as you said, I was starting out in um, in Jersey Flag and then I think I played half the, half the year for Jersey Flag and then got the call up to Cup and then um, I think it was, like, around 21 or something. Jimmy Maloney goes down, and then I get called straight up in the NRL, and it just happened so fast. But um, yeah, I don't know how I really dealt with it. I just, I just went along with it, and yeah, just went along with the ride, and it all happened pretty fast. And I just, yeah, just enjoyed every moment. Do you find when you were young, if someone told you that you were going to play flag, Reggie's, and first grade in a year, you would be really, really nervous, and you'd probably be like, "Nah, I can't do this," but because it just happened to you naturally yeah you just you don't what else do you do yeah, other than really, take it on yeah i didn't really have time to think about it or do it i just went after it i think as we were speaking about before the opportunities like i just wanted to take every opportunity when it come up and give it my best shot and i feel like i've done that and then sort of progressed me into where where i am now so so for me i remember i remember your debut i really do i remember i was sitting there and i was like i watched you come into that game and i just remember the commentators saying He's got so much composure, this kid. You know, your kicking game was exceptional that night. Has it always been a, you know, an asset of, of, of yours going into games, just being in full control? Your kicking game is probably your key coming through the grades, I'm assuming, and you just done that exact thing on the big stage. Yeah, my role was pretty simple. Um, I obviously got thrown in there and um, didn't really know any of the players or anything, so I just uh, was pretty lucky that they just kept it pretty simple for me and, that was pretty much my role, just kick early if I see something or take them on if you see anything and just back yourself. That was pretty much um, all I had that um, in my mind going into the game. So I was pretty fortunate that, yeah, we got the win and, um, yeah, it was an unbelievable night. I remember all my family there from Dubbo, there was like 100 people in the crowd. That was the best thing ever. So. It's fair to say you had to grow up pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, this is all happening, but at the same time, you've just moved down from Dubbo to Penrith. How did you cope with that? A, a lot of people, you know, they get homesick. Mm. And it, it takes their mind away from what they've actually got to do. But you just seem to, you know, overcome that and do what you had to do. Do you feel you were, you were mentally strong from a from a very young age? Or do you feel, you know, your family, did the family come down and help you a lot? Or how did you yeah, do all that? My family definitely helped me so much. Um, yeah, they were pretty much down every weekend. Like I was traveling down uh, every Friday and then, They'd pretty much drive on the Saturday as well just to be there and support me. So, yeah, I was pretty lucky enough that I had a really supportive family and 
they come down and just make it so much easier for me because a lot of boys come down and they get pretty homesick and that and yeah it's pretty scary when you're moving down from a small country town moving into the into the big smoke um yeah it's it was a hard transition but my family made it so much easier for me so so that Penrith team uh they'd been together for years they played together for so long in in the lower grades coming through did they have an impact on making it easy for you because I can I can feel for me personally when I come into training uh, and if the boys were helping me out or making me not think about things on the outside, it makes it so much easier. Were they were they a h- half the reason that, you know, they probably did get you through that tough time? Yeah, for sure. They were so supportive and uh, just made me feel really comfortable when I when I got thrown in there, which, um, yeah, I was really lucky in that aspect. But, um, it's, yeah, sort of, it was sort of the same thing coming through the system. Like We sort of trained for the same things and had the same same sort of plays in that coming into it. So, yeah, that, pretty, that made it pretty easy as well, so. Two guys I want to speak about. We've both been coached by them, Ivan Cleary and Ciro. How was Ciro as an assistant coach compared to a full, you know, a, a head coach now for the NRL? Was he very similar with you from Penrith to here, or do you feel he's, you know, changed changed a little bit? He probably had to change a little bit, but being the head coach now, um, I don't think he's changed too much to be honest. Like, uh, I only spent a little bit of time with him at Penrith. Um, he was defensive coach there, and then, yeah, coming here, it's, I don't reckon he's changed much. Um, he's obviously, yeah, had to change a little bit being head coach and um, probably just he's got to worry about a lot more and stuff. But, um, yeah, as a person, he's he's treated me the same, um, yeah, as I did at Penrith and whatnot. So. Ivan's a fairly calm guy. I feel Ciro's a bit the same. I, I, I realised Ivan was very calm when I actually signed for the Tigers uh, hadn't been in there yet, uh, fell off a scooter in Bali and broke my scapula. He was actually okay with it. <laughs> so I found yeah, out he was very, very calm. But yeah. do you feel Ciro, you know, learned a bit off Ivan in that, you know, probably not to get so worked up in games and, and just keep cool, calm and, and deliver your messages that way? Yeah, mate, yeah. Probably, yeah, just um, being assistant coach, just watching probably in the background, seeing how he goes by things and um, does things, I think. Yeah, it would have been good for him to do what he's doing now. So, so debut 2019, 2021, you're in a grand final. Yeah. Um, just explain to us, I suppose, how that how that happened. And you were actually you're in the centres that year. Yeah. You 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 got Dally M centre of the year. In a team like that, you know, at, at the peak of their powers, or oh, for you personally. Did you just have to do your role in that team? You didn't have to, you know, step out and obviously you had some big games. But I just feel from look from a looking from afar, it just seems like a team. If you if you do your role, you'll be fine. Yeah, for sure. I think you nailed it. Yeah, I just had to go in there and then play my role and um, do whatever's best for the team. And um, yeah, it was a crazy year that year. I, um, I think I got thrown in there at centre uh, round three and then end up playing the rest of the year at centre. And then yeah, being in the grand final was crazy. I mean, before the grand final, I didn't sleep for like three days. I was that <laughs> nervous. But yeah, that was one of the best games ever. We'll, we'll go back a step. So you get tossed from 5'8 into the centres. For me personally, honestly, if I was if I was playing the type of player I was, I couldn't do it. Like, because I just, I know how hard it is defensively as a centre. Yeah. Just the reads and, well, I had a couple of tough carries in me, but not many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... No, how did you how did you cope with it? I, yeah, like I probably can. I know the type of guy you are, so you just take anything as it comes. But were you nervous that that year when you know Ivan asked you to go from five eight to the centres? Yeah, I was shit myself at the start, but I was just lucky enough that there was good people around me that um, helped me out and um, yeah made that transition easier. Picked it up, um, you know, had Critter there to sort of talk to him about it. He was he was in the on the other side, so um, he helped me out a lot and. Yeah, there's a lot of boys there that just um, yeah helped me out and made that transition a lot easier. So, so back to the grand final, you actually scored the first try, mate. That must be a massive moment, um, scoring a try in the grand final and something that you you'll remember forever. Yeah, I think it's just um, looking back on it now, them them little moments um, you'll never forget, sort of thing. Um, yeah, still, yeah, I still really can't believe it. Like. Um, it's, it all happens pretty quick, but um, yeah, I remember after I scored that first try, the, like the energy was up and everyone came in. Um, 
Yeah, it was a mad team. So, so you've won a grand final. You got the ring. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had that feeling before. But anyway, that's all good. How is that feeling, though, mate? Honestly, I've always it's my biggest. It's not a regret for me, but it's obviously I, I wanted it. I was in two grand grand finals, lost two, but it must be the best feeling just winning it with your mates. Yeah, for sure. Your um, yeah, you work so hard during the year. Um, and the team's got that desire for that goal at the end of the year, and um, yeah, when you get to that stage and you you pull it off, you're not sort of thinking about the result at, um, before the game. You're just um, thinking about what you can do um, during the game. But yeah, when the hurdle went and um, we ended up winning it, it's the best thing ever. Um, party for a couple of days, and um, <laughs> yeah, we enjoyed it. So that was yeah, it made some lifelong memories, and yeah, you never forget it. So. That was actually my next question. How many days? But a couple of <laughs> so we'll say it was four. We'll double that. So yeah. definitely four days. But all right, so you win the grand final, top of the world. Um talk to us about this next period. So yeah, obviously you're in the team, you you're killing at Penrith, but the dogs come calling. Yeah. How did this come about? And who made the who actually made the first call to get you over here to the dogs? Um uh, Baz was at um, Penrith at the time and um, when he when he come to the dogs he um, yeah he was talking to me a bit and um, just said how would you like um, the opportunity to come over I was playing centre at the time but always grew up playing 5-8 and wanted to play 5-8 so yeah when that up opportunity come up I, I couldn't really resist it and um, yeah I just ended up signing it and um, yeah I'm loving my time here now so so Mate, you obviously had Cleary there, Luai there, but is it fair to say the reason you come was because you wanted to play 5-8? It wasn't because those two guys were, you know, pretty instilled in, in that halves combination there at Penrith. You just wanted, you wanted to be, you wanted to be a 5-8 and you wanted to make your mark on a team? Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously want to be a 5-8 and, you know, they were pretty set there, Jerome and Nafe at the time at Penrith and, um, yeah, as soon as the opportunity come up here, I had to take it with both hands and, um. How did you find that, mate? You know, you, you go from Penrith, you come to the Bulldogs, a big club, a lot of expectation, especially in the halves, passionate fan base, probably not the greatest start, not for yourself, but as a team, yeah. you know, that things haven't been great here in the in the last couple of years. How did you deal deal with, you know, winning a grand final to, you know, not not winning many games? And for you personally, did it have an impact on yourself, the way you, you thought about games or the way you thought about your role, or you just tried to do things the same as you did at Penrith? Yeah, it was a pretty good learning um, learning curve for myself, obviously coming from Penrith and then coming to the Dogs and, um, you know, accepting that responsibility. And, um, yeah, obviously we didn't have the best start um, at the time. And, yeah, I learned a, I learned a lot of lessons um, at the start and, yeah, obviously my thought process going into games and how I can control um, myself and what's best for the team. I sort of was thinking about too much, um, thinking about results and um, whatnot, but I've really started to focus on what I can do to add as much value to the side, how I can be at my best and um, just simplifying my role before going into games. I think that's something that I've been doing at the moment and it's helping a lot. So, I find it amazing how, uh, as a half, I, I remember I, I just put a lot of pressure on myself uh, going into games, but funnily enough, if you just nail your role, you'll be right. Yeah. Like, did you feel that little bit of extra pressure, big signing for the club, great money? Um, <laughs> but no, did you actually feel feel that little bit of extra pressure, whereas at yeah. Penrith you just had to do your role, as you said, in the centres? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was obviously under a lot of pressure and didn't really know how to deal with it. I was yeah stressing a lot before games, obviously. Yeah, worried about the outcome before actually running out in the field. And, um, yeah, that's something that I've learned, just taking my game to the jersey and giving it my best. And, um, yeah, I feel like I've been doing that at the moment. So. Yeah, you absolutely have. But So last year, um, probably a massive moment in your life, Zero asked you to be, to be co-captain with Reedy. How, how did you, honestly, how did you deal with when Zero said it to you, did you, were, you, were, you, were you happy? Were you a little bit nervous? And did you feel, you know, the captaincy like come natural to you or did you have to sort of work on that? Because I know for me personally, I could have never done it. I just was a guy who 
I suppose I look to people sometimes. How did how, how did you go with the, with the whole capacity, mate? Did you did you yeah, enjoy it? It was definitely challenging. Um, you know, I look back on it now, and yeah, when they gave me the opportunity, I was, like, I don't know, I wasn't really ready for it. Um, yeah, I learned a lot about myself during that time. It was obviously pretty challenging. Had a lot of ups and downs, but um, yeah, when I think about it now, sort of, yeah, I wasn't really ready for it, and um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm better for it now. I've learned a lot out of it, and how I can benefit, um, yeah, from them lessons during during that time. And yeah, we obviously weren't going that good, and um, yeah, you cop a lot of criticism and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's made me better for it now. So mm. it's actually. It's pretty cool that you can actually say that you've learned from it. A lot of people can be a bit sour, you know. You, you you're not you're not captain now, but for me personally, if, if it means anything, mate, I thought you were a great leader. You don't necessarily, as Ciro says, you can lead in many different ways. You know, I thought you just led led with your actions, and it is. It's a learning curve for everyone. Yeah. You know, if it make if it makes you feel any better, I was never in a leadership group. <laughs> but no, honestly, it's uh, I I just for me, I just want you to. I just don't want you to think it's a bad thing that like you're not captain anymore. Yeah. Because honestly, like you're a massive part of this this club and everything, you know, that happened last year, you know, for you and for you and Reedy. It's just all a all a learning curve and yeah. these are all leaders in your in your own natural way. So mm. um so this year it's obviously been given a critter. Yeah. Um I I can tell I interviewed him when he first got the captaincy. I, I feel he's a bit nervous too. This is a thing. I feel everyone, you know, the outside people think Oh well, he has to be good straight away. He has yeah. to be a great leader. Not easy to be a leader, is it? No, I think yeah, that's something sort of touched on it before. You just got to learn. I'm I was sort of similar to yourself. I sort of had to learn along the way what leadership means, what it what it involves, and how you can lead. Um, just being yourself as well, and yeah, that's something that I'd never really done before. And accepting it was like it, it's obviously nerve wracking. Accepting it and then um, doing it. So yeah, I feel like critters are that at that point in his career where he's, he's confident and uh, he's just backing himself and yeah, he's doing an outstanding job at the moment. So, Or do you think the best asset at the moment for Critter is as a captain or what's he doing well, f- um, you know, to teach our young boys to, to lead us, you know, in, into into big games? I think just his preparation around the joint. Um, he's a world-class player and his preparation before games, um, I think everyone in the side um, can see it and it's contagious. All the boys are... Um, really seeing that and um, implementing it into their games as well. Obviously, I'm doing it myself, just seeing how he prepares and um, yeah, it only makes the team better. So, All right, segment two, mate. We just want to have a chat about a couple of assets of your game and yep. we're just going to break it down here uh, on the screen. So the first one, uh, for me personally, when I watch you play and when you've got that run first mentality, it's it's when you play your best. In the in the Sharkies game, I think you had 10 runs for 120-odd metres um so yeah i just wanted to i suppose get your input on what you're thinking on this this exact play and and sort of what made you run the sable watcher then break it down yeah i think at in this moment um there was obviously shape coming towards the edge um i was at the back of shape and then um yeah as i said as you said um i think about my best when i'm running and um yeah i just seen ramian turn out a bit and that was sort of my cue to come off my left foot um Trindle was running um, sideways as well, so that was my cue to take him on, and um, yeah, nearly got through. But so you speak about um, cues. Can you sort of explain to um, our audience what what you mean when you say a cue? I guess just what the defence is, um, what they're doing, and um, how you adjust to it. If you see something they're doing, that um, it usually gives you a cue to um, uh, sort of yeah adjust to what they're doing and. Um, for for your attack, so so it's fair to say that you haven't gone into that play thinking I'm 100 percent running or 100 percent passing. You're just waiting for the defence to give you give you a cue, yeah. and then you you'll make your decision on that. Yeah. So that's when you said I think you said it was Ramian. He sort of come up. Yeah, sort of come up. He showed it out at the last minute, so that was my cue to sort of show and go and go through. So yeah, nice. Yeah, so I, I feel for you for you personally. Is that when you feel you're at your best when yeah, you, when you're sure. running? Yeah, run first. Man I just feel like I'm in the game when I've got my hands on the ball and um, things are happening around me. If I'm running the ball, then um, yeah, I'm going to the game instead of the game going past me, sort of thing. So yeah, nice. All right, so this next one, um, 
it's actually, I actually just want to speak about this, your, your left edge. So the left edge at the moment is yourself, Kicks, Critter, and at the moment it's um, Connor, yep. Tracy. So he's probably the odd man out here in, in, the, in the little uh, Penrith, Penrith bro match you've got going on there. But on, on a serious note, yeah, you must feel safe and connected with those blokes, like playing with them so long. Yeah, for sure. It definitely helps having that connection and um, knowing that boys for such a long time. It it shows out on the field. Um, yeah, that connection and um, yeah, it's mad to have them boys playing outside me. It's yeah, it's. It, is it fair to say? Like, I know we'll, we'll break down your um, involvement in this play, but for kicks and critter, I don't think many people or many um, back rows centre combinations would get this play if they hadn't played together for a long time because. Kicks or Reese runs an overs line on Mitch Moses' outside shoulder and then Critter knows to back him up. Yeah. So I think that just comes back down to connection. Like Kicks just has an instinct that he's going to be there. And um, yeah, for Critter to know when he's swinging around the corner just to back him up, mm -hmm. like, just comes back to that connection and um, knowing how each other plays really. So Yeah, nice. So I want to break this down here. This is probably for all, all young halves listening. This is... I suppose this is having an impact on a play without having an impact. And we talk about your, you know, your sweet blood here. So short, um, I'm always thinking Kicks has got an offload in him, so I'm thinking support on the outside. I know there's going to be space if that centre closes in on him, so I know he's going to get his hands free. And, um, yeah, as soon as he hits short, I just know that I've got to be swinging around the back in case like, the ball pops out and... Um, on this one, it went across my face. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, yeah. that, what's happening? <laughs> but no, obviously, like we spoke about before, yeah, gets through and, and knows critters there. Yeah. Amazing try, but it's, it's, a, it's fairly important as a half to always be pushing around the ball. And as, as you said, it's just combinations, yeah. Um, you, you obviously have a play with your left edge there. It, it, will there be a difference? Let's just say it kicks runs and doesn't run that overs line, but runs a um, you know an unders line. Does that change for you, or you sort of just? I think it's yeah. I'd still do the same thing. I reckon if he if he cut back um, instead of an overs line, I'd still want to be pushing around um, just a big body, and he's got a um, offload in him. So yeah, just that support so important. If if um, someone breaks the line and I'll be there, so nice. Hopefully, you many more tries to come yeah. from, that, from that left edge. And mate, the final one for me is it's it's becoming a uh, it's becoming a a household name. The Birdo Bomb. Yeah. If if you haven't heard it yet, you haven't been watching for you for the last three or four years. But I just wanted to, minus the actual kick. Do you actually know how how much of an impact it actually has on on little kids at at footy grounds on 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 people? Because you know, there's the Benji Marshall step. There's the, the Gordon Talis Ragdoll, but now there's the Birdo Bomb. It must feel good to have something named after you. Yeah, it's pretty special. Um, yeah, I guess when I go back out and uh, back at home and that, and even after games and stuff, there's little kids coming up, put a Birdo Bomb up. But <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool to see the kids um, get a smile out of it. And that's, yeah, that's what I take out of it. So, um, but yeah, in this one, um, yeah, I guess I only do it when I feel like there's an opportunity. Um, to put pressure on the fullback, sort of thing, um, and if it's the right if it's the right play for the team, um, I don't just want to go there and just put torpies up left right, <laughs> centre. But I would if I. Could. <laughs> if, if there's a chance, agree. yeah. If there's a chance that I can isolate the fullback and I'll hook it back to the other side, um, then I'll try and get an answer. That actually used to call me. Mine was for the Reynolds pop gun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, but I just want. So if we watch this clip right here and we pause it right now, you're obviously getting some pressure there. Um, from the markers, but the way you're holding the ball there, um, can you explain to us, you know, what you what you're doing, and you know, will you always hold the ball like that, or, while like it's flat? Yeah, I reckon. Um, I usually, if I've got time, I usually put my hand on the top and face the ball, so it's facing up right. That way, I can get it um, spiraling the right, right way. But um, if I've got plenty of time, um, I usually just hold it on under my arm and. Um, yeah, just try and give it as much as I got. But yeah, I sort of just put heaps of practice into it, and then now it just comes off um, as a habit. So is it fair to say you're trying to hit the belly of the ball? Yeah, you know, yeah, I do hit the belly of the ball. I just try and make the ball um, facing upright. I think most people when they do it, they have the ball flat, mm. but I try and face it upright, and that way it um, goes higher. So 
Well, there you go, kids. If you want to do a birdo bomb, don't hit the belly, like I said. But <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just watch it here. It's 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 a huge kick, man. And it's honestly, as you said, for me, people don't realise how much of an impact it can have on the game. But the funny thing is, I was in the crowd on the weekend, and you do, you hear just all, all the little kids, bird up bomb. Yeah. But they were me after the weekend. Were they? All the kids. You didn't put up a bird up bomb. <laughs> <laughs> but more you, you've got to kick the corners. It, yeah. It's all about, you know, you know, the timing. But made a great weapon to have, and um, you should be proud of yourself, mate. You've you made a, uh, you've made it. There's going to probably be there forever. Yeah. There's, there can't be anyone with a bigger bomb than that. Hopefully. You reckon? Yeah. All oh, right, Beautiful. Let's take some time to reflect here. Hazem sideline conversion in 2002. Trent Hodkinson's field goal in 2014. Thrifty becoming the Bulldogs' official car rental sponsor in 2023. Some of the greatest moments in Bulldogs history. Which one is best? Bulldogs fans can score 15% off the base rate of day with Thrifty. For the best deals on car rentals, visit www.thrifty.com.au slash Bulldogs. Sec 3, we wanted to delve into you. Maddie Burton a little bit. A couple of quirky questions, but we want to get to know you a little bit more. But we want to talk about a massive moment in your, in your life as well. Uh, so 2022, we played the West Tigers at Convex Stadium. Uh, normal preparation for you, mate? Is everything go, going as normal? Or Yeah, it was, a, it was a funny one, that one. Um, yeah, that was... That was one of the craziest um, game preps that I've had sort of thing leading up to a game. I remember, yeah, woke up and all these articles started getting leaked that I was going to play Origin. And all my family's texting me saying, like, oh, congrats, congrats. And my head's going everywhere. I'm thinking, what's going on? No one's told me what, it, what I'm doing. Like, I don't know if it's true or not. But all I wanted to think about was the game first, like, just play my best for, for the boys and then worry about all that after. But, um, yeah, I remember... Um, we ended up beating Tigers at Combank um, and then yeah I had an interview with Triple M after the game um, I was talking to them and they're like oh congrats mate you've made Origin what are, you, what are your thoughts on that and I'm going what are you beating on <laughs> I don't know yeah thanks for that like I was rattled because no one had told me what was going on and then um, yeah as soon as I got off the interview Freddie comes straight up to me he's like yeah, you're making your day Origin debut and I was like oh, at the stadium yeah oh well, yeah just hit me out. But, yeah, we got in the sheds and that, and then um, they ended up telling the boys, and the boys were going off, so it was my best feeling ever. Thanks for that, Freddie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was just me the other side, like, oh, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I, can't, I can't imagine it would have been, yeah, your, your normal preparation. Mm. As you said, you got 35,000. Yeah, it's hard to get your head around, head around that one. So that all happens. You, you win the Bulldogs game, you get home, it sinks in. You're playing Origin. How does that feel? How does, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to your family? Yeah, it means everything to put that um, that blue jersey on. Um, yeah, obviously watching it as a kid, that's all you ever want to do is get in that arena. And um, Yeah, it was, a, it was the craziest thing, even ringing my family and telling them they're just proud of me and, um, yeah, just a proud me, uh, family. Proud moment for my family and myself and... Um, yeah, just all the hard work that's paid off, and yeah, it's pretty special. So, quite amazing how you know everyone says, "Oh, how do you feel?" and that moment, but it's such a big moment for your family too. Like they ride the roller coaster, but you they would have ridden the roller coaster from when you're 18 years old, leaving Dubbo, coming down, supporting you, play for Penrith, winning grand finals, coming to the Bulldogs, playing Origin. Yeah. It's just it's you, you feel you feel like you're doing. You represent the family, are you? Yeah, for sure. They're just with you every step of the way. And, um, yeah, just really lucky to have them in my corner. And um, they just back me all the way. And, yeah, as you said, they're just you're just doing it for them pretty much. Like, it's a great moment for yourself and you're proud. But, um, yeah, to, you know, the feeling that they get out of it and um, how proud they get, um, yeah, it runs deep, um, even for the whole Dubbo community and, <clears throat> um, yeah, friends and family. It's just... Yeah, to see them that way, it makes you even prouder. So mm, I'm sure all the Sims boys are fired up. <laughs> all Maddie Burt number six on their blues jerseys. But no, nah, as you said, mate, a proud moment for yourself and your family. Yeah. Let's go let's speak about that arena. Um so when I when I was lucky enough to get in that squad as well, I one thing I just could not 
believe was how much hatred there was. You, you literally, as soon as you get into camp, you're taught to hate them. And for Matty Burton, the way I would describe you is you're, you're a great bloke, you're humble, but I just don't know if you could hate many people. How did you go with embracing the hate? Yeah, it was actually mad. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I got into that arena, it was just, yeah, all the talk was about, like, how much we are going to give it to them. And, um, yeah, I remember my first game. Um, yeah, there was so much talk about what we were going to do and, um, yeah, just talking about them. Yeah, it just, it just rolls you up and, um, yeah, to look around the room and see the boys that are in that room as well, as you know. Mm. Um, yeah, it's pretty special and it's a pretty surreal moment when you when you run out there and um, you're actually playing on that arena. So, Yeah, I, I'm just actually so interested like from you personally because for me, it's very easy for me to hate someone. <laughs> I go into games hating people all the time. So it was me. I get into camp and go far in that little like hate this guy, hate that guy. I was like, I already do. <laughs> yeah. So it was easy for me, but yeah, yeah I just thought for you, you, you know, you're a very, you're a very nice guy. You're a little yeah. nicer than me. Uh, but like, yeah, when I just, I'm going to get out of there, I just flick a switch and yeah, just compete. So let's talk about that switch. And I know you spoke about this before, but mate, let's speak about it. Any boxing career <laughs> after this, because <laughs> definitely not. Dave Gagai, <laughs> Matty Burton. All right, let's break this down. Have you ever had a fire on the field before? And did you think that would ever happen in that arena? No, no, definitely not. <laughs> oh, it does a bit of redhead just come out there. Yeah, the, on the biggest stage. I don't know. It just happened so fast. That, yeah. Just throwing a few. Yeah. And when it comes back to the hate, though. Like, yeah, it is. That's it is. all you talk about. You just, you don't want to let that jersey down and you're just giving it everything and you've got so much aggression during the game and then little moments happen and you don't even think about it. You're just that. You stop, but you just yeah. yeah. You know what I feel? You because we when, when like well, probably not me, but like sorry you, but when I was growing up, Origin was about fights, yeah. fights everywhere. Yeah. Joey Johns, all this like it was, it was happening. Yeah. But then, you know, I even had a little face rub <laughs> on the ground, but but there's no fights anymore. But to see that, mate, as a proud grub, I was very proud. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, especially to to a Queenslander, but. Yeah. All right, so let's 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 go to the next level. Um, you, you represent um, the green and gold. Mm. Mate, it's the pinnacle. It's you've done everything now. Um, you, you, you get chosen in that world world cup squad. How does I'll ask again? How, how does you feel and what? How, how uh, sorry? Let me re re this. How does you feel about getting picked and how was that tour? Yeah, obviously another proud moment to get picked in that side. Um, yeah, some of the players that you're playing alongside, um, some of the best in the world. And um, yeah, it was just a great experience to go over there and travel the world and um, yeah, to play some quality sides over there. I was lucky enough to get two games in and um, yeah, just to put that jersey on again. Um, yeah, it's just sort of pinch yourself moment. And um, yeah, as I said before, it's just a proud moment for me and my family. Um, to represent um, Australia and, yeah, hopefully get back there one day. And, um, yeah, as you said, just a tour of the world, the other side of the world, it was, it was pretty crazy going over there and, um, yeah, especially winning it. That was mad, mad tour. So we'll go back to the actual team. Did you feel in that Australian team, uh, you know, obviously very dominant in that World Cup, was it quite easy for you in that team to just do your role again? Yeah, yeah. just... Just go, turn up, compete, and and the rest will sort of happen for you. Yeah, you're right. That's that was pretty much it. Just go there and um, do your job and don't let the team down. That's probably the biggest thing going into it. Um, yeah, try not to overthink it. Um, you get a bit nervous and whatnot. Putting that jersey on. Um, yeah, it was just mad, but to go over there and experience that, so pretty grateful. Yeah, I just just find it amazing and fascinating how. Like, for me personally, I look at the ex-players that have put that jersey on and the ex-players that have put that Australian jersey on, mate, you should be super proud because it's something not many people can say, mate. You yeah. know, like, even now, we've both put on the great Terry Lambs jersey. Yeah. And, like, I, I love that. I embrace it. So, to do it in the Aussie jersey, you should be super proud. But let's go back to the tour. Mm. Any stories? Surely, you hear about these tours, mate. I, 
I honestly, <laughs> this might sound bad, I wanted to make the Australian team just to go on tour. <laughs> I'll go, I'll be the player. I'll just be the tour guide. I'll be the, I'll start the, you know, like I'm going to win. Yeah, the Kentucky Australian tour. I've got an idea, it's got a read to it. I'm not reading, I don't want to say too much, but um, <laughs> no, nah, there's some funny stories that, like, um, so the boys that don't play, we will called the Emus. And I only played two games, so um, yeah, I was an emu a fair few times. Um, but yeah, the emus were so you do the boys would do captain's run, you'd do the top up, and then after that, you just it's compulsory to go get on the beers. <laughs> so yeah, you'd go out for um, for dinner, and then after that, you're just on the beers with the boys and they run the muck. So consider me an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's all me up. Yeah, yeah I, I've heard stories and um, of it. That's one thing I wanted to ask as well. So, in the Australian team, there's obviously Queenslanders in that, and I've heard stories where they've clashed. Yeah. How did you boys go with that? Was there a bit of a Yeah, there? there was a bit of tension, actually, a couple of sessions. Um, it got a bit heated and that. Boys just a bit of push and shove. And, really? Yeah. Oh, it was pretty that. crazy. Like, you were gang training was that in- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, a few training sessions there. There's got a bit heated and a bit of push and shove and that. Just because boys different teams and yeah, yeah, it's just got that that rivalry sort of thing. But both these are on the same team. Yeah, they like, still that. Yeah, like just that. it's good, but it's who's the hooker? How did you? Harry Grant. Oh, so he's he's going to a Queensland all the time. Yeah, Cherry Evans. Yeah. Oh, Harry, Carlos <laughs> left. <laughs> oh, mate, no, nah, but I love that. Like, even though you know you're in Australia team, you're representing it. But how about when you were? How about the Emus? Was there was there when you were on the Emus? Was there any clean leaders there or, or yourself? Well, yeah, everyone sort of got along, but you're just on the drink. When you're having yourself, yeah, hey, I love it. All right, mate. So let's get away from footy. These are a few questions. Yeah. I wanted to ask you personally. So I know I know you had a laugh about this, but in the NFL, it's been tossed up before. Like, honestly, would you would you do it? If if like let's just say how many more let's just say Berta, you play for ten more years, you hang the boots up, but then the Philadelphia Eagles, my 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 favourite team, they come to you and they offer you I think punters get about a million. Are you going? Yeah, I'd give it a crack. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, give it a not to. Would you actually? Yeah. Yeah, if I was a bit older, give it a crack, then, yeah, I don't know. It's one of those things, though. Like, yeah. There's heaps of Aussies going there now. Every eh? second oh, person asks me. I'm yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? There's a couple of Aussies over there at the moment. It's pretty cool to see them going over there and doing up. So, yeah. I think down the track, it'd, yeah, I'd, I'd consider it. Not now. No, I can keep the handles off you now, yeah. but a couple of years, uh, why not? Live it, live the life. There you go, around. So yeah. Just a couple of mil. <laughs> Thanks for covering you up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, Kentucky. I don't know the Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, mate, this is a, 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 probably one of the proudest moments of your life, uh, becoming a dad. Yeah. Um, how much of an impact did that have on your life? And mm. is Matty Burt, Burton a different guy now that you're a father? Yeah, I think I've grown up a fair bit. Um, after having him, yeah, just... That's definitely the proudest moment of my life, having him. Um, yeah, I was sort of before that, I'll, everything was about footy and just didn't really have much outside of footy, so he sort of opened my eyes to um, that and, yeah, he's been the best thing ever. Um, little Noah, he's seven, eight months old now, so growing up too quick and, yeah, loving every bit of it. Uh, I speak to a lot of guys that are dads uh, throughout my career and they say it, they say it'll kids put things into perspective. Mm. So if you've had a bad day, you've had a bad loss, you can come home, see the smile on their face. Has Noah had that effect on you, mate? Yeah, for sure. He just makes me that happy. Like, I literally, yeah, if we have a loss, then just go home and he's smiling regardless. Um, yeah, it just puts a smile on your face. And yeah, seeing him happy makes you happy. So yeah, that's, the best, that's the best thing. Love that, man. You're looking to have a few more, mate, or you? Yeah, down the track. Maybe have a couple more. And yeah, good. I think the big question is all the Bulldogs fans want to know yeah. can no one do a Birdo Bomb? Oh, it won't be long at Aaron. <laughs> yeah, he's already nearly running around and he's only eight months old, so <laughs> I reckon he'll be putting holes through the wall shortly. Big left footer? Yeah. Is he a left footer? I don't know. You've got to make him. Yeah. Left footer. <laughs> he's got, yeah. he got such a sweet kid. Yeah. Nah, that's, that's nice to hear, man. Yeah. Uh, so. 
you doing anything uh, outside of footy, mate? Obviously, footy contains a lot of, a lot of your life. Martin, have you, have you thought about outside of footy yet? Yeah, doing a business course at the moment. Um, just sort of give it a crack, something different. See where it takes me. Um, yeah, just get my mind away from footy a bit. Try something different. But, yeah, just see how that goes at the moment. And, yeah, it's going all right. It's not easy, um, I always found, uh, playing footy. But you know in the back of your mind it doesn't last forever. Yeah. And I'm actually obviously going through it right now. I've recently retired. But you know it's good for you, but it's still hard, isn't it? It's still hard. Yeah, I think you said after this you got to go and do the course. Yeah. But you know in the long run it, it's going to help you out. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's good to always have something in your back pocket. Um, yeah, obviously footy doesn't last forever. And you got to think about that. But, um, yeah, I thought I'd just give it a crack and do something away from footy and open, open a new door. Oh, well, that's it, mate. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. You're linked in. No, get it, bro. <laughs> Isn't this? You look smart. Put a good jacket on him, mate. Oh, you should see my LinkedIn photo. Real estate agent. I've done it for one day. You have to get it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, David. No, all right. So if you retire tomorrow, what are you? What are you doing? If you have to retire, unfortunately, but I, you, mm. you, you got to retire. That's a good question. Jeez, mm. you got me there. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't mind opening my own business. I don't know really what I want to do, but I want to own my own business and um, yeah, go down that path. And yeah, I don't really know what I do. Yeah, and but some do. That's why I'm doing the business. I think. Yeah, get a few ideas and yeah. If I was retired tomorrow, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know actually. Mate, I actually know a great. Um, I don't know if there's any jobs available, but the Bulldogs ambassador is a great job, great yeah. role. Come here, hang out with me and Barb every day. Sweet, done. Speak about golf. <laughs> and don't know what else we talk about. Shave and shave each other's heads. Yeah. That's going to be great greatest shave the other day. But, mate, uh, so in your spare time, um, you got a jet ski, don't you? Mm. You get in on that often? Nah, not really. <laughs> don't have any time for that anymore with the kid, with the buff. But, um, yeah, if we, if we get a few days off, take the boys out and, have a muck around. Been getting into surfing as well. Yeah, I'd go surfing. Got a little crew there going. So yeah, who just back to the jet ski? Did you feel, you know, coming from Penrith to mm-hmm. Belmore? Belmore's a very multicultural area. You have to, yeah, you have to buy a jet ski. Yeah. You're actually not allowed. To, I don't think you're allowed, allowed back over the the bridge. You have <laughs> a jet ski in the trailer. It'll be a lot to get one. <laughs> I never had to buy one because I lived in Belmore, so I just used everyone else's. But yeah. you feel a bit of pressure, eh? Yeah, I did. Get, but um, get the jet skin cars. No, we actually went at um, Brighton a couple of weeks ago, and well, I can believe it. Like the jet, the amount of jet skis that were lined up along Brighton there, yeah, just smashing into each other. And all the, I think me and Karaz and a few of the boys are down there. Everyone's coming up. There's <laughs> actually a stat I, I read it the other day. Ninety five percent of jet ski owners are bulldog supporters. <laughs> I don't believe it. So yeah, we've got a very big jet ski uh, community here at Belmore. But you speak about the Surfers Club. Mm. I'm very interested. I didn't know about this till till yeah. today. So what's a, who's involved? Who's the leader? Mm. I'd say Curtis Moran's up there with being the leader. Yes. Yeah. He's he's the most experienced, but. Reed Marnie thinks that, yeah, you know, being the sunny coast boy, yeah, you yes. know, he's got that, you know, where's the rashy? He does. That's it out. There's a few of us, me, Curtis, Reed, um, Josh Curran. He looks like a bit of a surfer. Yeah, he's got the head. Longer hair. Mix your nose with his own. Yeah. So what's the go? Is there like initiation? He's got a name. You no, know? nah, we, we should come up with a little, I reckon, little name. Yeah. I'll, I'll, if you can tell me by the next potty what yeah. the aim is, I'll shout us out. Might have a bit of merch coming in. Yeah, there you go. Business. Yeah. Well, this is <laughs> bring so many different feats. Oh, beautiful, mate. So that's it for Seg 3. Seg 4, this is a this is a, a big one. I'm going to ask you some just some classic questions from our fans. Yep. Do you know why it's called classic questions? Because it's brought to you sure. by, by classic. Great shirt too, isn't it? It is. So they're very tired. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, well, I like it. I, it's large too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're gonna. What we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you a couple of questions. And this is brought to you by the, the fans, fan voted questions, and then we're gonna play category for it. Now, category is yeah, hard. Could be better than easy. <laughs> All right. So question one: Was there any ex bulldogs you used to look up to? 
um, you know, when you were young or, or coming through and tried to base your game on? Um, obviously yourself. Thank you. All right, question two. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously watching you, um, just the passion you had and, um, yeah, how much pride you, you wear the jersey with. It was, um, yeah, obviously growing up watching you and um, Betty Barber as well, running a muck, so. Well, yeah. we actually didn't. I didn't know that that was planned, but we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> um, this might be a hard one for you. What's one thing no one knows about you? Um, some question. One thing no one knows about me? Um, I don't know. It's a hard one. Yeah, it's, mine was, what was mine? I don't think anyone asked me this question, but I'll say it anyway. Mine was that, um, well, normally when I was a plumber, the yeah, overweight is before, but let's just say I would not be calling 1-800-GRUBS for this <laughs> is any time soon. Something that someone doesn't know about me. Um, but have a think about it. We'll go to the next question. What's your pre, have you got any pre-game rituals? Um... Uh, I saw, I do this weird thing before I run out. Like every time I put my boots on, I tie my laces up and I always like, like touch my boots. Really? Yeah. I don't know. It's just I've always done it. Love that. Just know that it's yeah. weird. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to wear the same Mondays, but they used to they get holding them. But then I used to just buy the same like coloured pair of Mondays. Yeah. Like they just used to get ripped up. So right. So Seggy Four. I was just trying to explain this category to Birdo. I'm not sure if everyone knows how categories play, but so you get 60 seconds to get as many answers as you can. There's 12 answers, but Birdo thought it was for one. <laughs> Unfortunately, mate, you got to try and get. Oh, bad. You've got to try and get 12. So, yeah, let's do it. Sammy Hughes went all right. He got two. <laughs> so, I've got two to beat. You got two to beat. No, no. But you were against me. Yeah. No, no. I got 11. Mm. No, I didn't. I got four. I think I was two. <laughs> all right. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, the letter's D, by the way. Go. I've had to skip questions here. Have ya? Yeah. All right, so we've got to get this. Did anyone finish? No, oh, I've got... I've got four. Seven. Wow. Well, but I don't know if they're going to be... You can do that, right? Skip the question. Yep. All right. Here we go. I don't even know if this is... It's all right. It's all right. This is the thing. We've got judges in the room, so we'll ask the judges if, if, they're, if they're okay with the answers. So the letter was D, uh, things in a souvenir shop. Dictionary. Yeah. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. give that. I'm not sure who's buying a dictionary. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, we're going to go to the shop and buy a dictionary today. <laughs> I got Disney toys. Any? All right. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. In a shop. Come on. All right. Reason, reason to call 911. I'm dead. Dead body. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's good. That's yeah. probably... I didn't even think of that. Mine was domestic dispute. Oh. Very detailed. Yeah, because I got double D. Is that true? No. No. Okay. <laughs> that's it. Things you do every day. I miss that. Missed it? Yeah. I put... Dob. <laughs> I, I dob You're on not going to pay that, eh? No, I dob on people in the office all the time. Like, oh, Hattie, right, she, right. she never... He never gives me any attention, so I always yeah, don't want to. We'll pay that. Yeah, nah, nah, we won't, we won't. All right, I'll, 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 I'll skip that. All right, household chores. I dry clothes. Nice. And dishes. Yeah. Nice. So what's that, three each? By the way, if we have the same answer, it's it's cancelled out, right? Is it? I'm pretty sure. All right. Sports played indoors. I missed it. Dance. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. There wouldn't be there wouldn't be many that you could think of. That's probably the only one I can. Tr- it's a good answer. <laughs> so the we'll, uh, number six is diet foods. I miss that as well. Yeah, I have nothing. Number seven, JT would be filthy. <laughs> oh yeah, you should get that. <laughs> and be filthy if he's watching it. Dijon mustard. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Store names. Nah, I miss that as well. Domino's pizza. Yeah, no. Ching. Uh, honeymoon spots. I daydream one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mine was Disneyland. Oh, 
<laughs> for the honeymoon. Go yeah. On. Mate, yeah? mate, you take my mum, you take her to see Minnie. Shut the game. Yeah, she's sweet. Yeah, she, yeah, she's in. She might be even going home with Mickey. Don't worry about Dan. <laughs> oh. All right, not going to lie, but no more. You got your arm done. All right, so we tally up the scores. What'd you get? I got four. Good old four. Just a lazy six. What was it out of? Four out of 12. Four out of 12. Six out of 12. I reckon we keep a, a leaderboard for this, so... Yeah. BC, it's not a bad start. It's hard. It is. It is very hard, and I have played this a lot. I, when the girls say go do prep for the podcast, I just play the category <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, you've done your prep. Yeah, so... Um, well, mate... Thanks for coming on. No, thanks for having me. The biggest question that everyone wants to know. You've been on a podcast before. No. <laughs> you've, been, um, you've been asked the no, question. Sure. Oh, no, you've been asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> and we figured out what shape the world is yet. No. No comment. <laughs> and that is a very good answer. But I love that. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Awesome stuff, man. Well,